I'm Lily Fountain, chair of the Natural Places Committee that this uh, Endangered Species Work Group is part of. And I'd like to <clears> welcome <throat> everybody he who's here who uh, might be new to Sierra Club. Seems like we've got some really good uh, interest and awareness for butterflies, which is terrific. Many of the people that I know came to butterflies through birding or came to butterflies through botany. Um, some of them came to butterflies through dragonflies, although it's usually the other way around. Um, a lot of ways to get involved in uh, butterfly observation, butterfly research. It's a great area for citizen science. There are even some areas we can talk about tonight where citizens like you guys can make, or community science as I prefer to call it, Community citizens like you folks they make your real contributions to understanding the, um, the both the uh, abundance and the conservation options for a number of our butterflies. All right, that's a that's a good poll. It's got, it gives me a really good sense of uh, where we are with everybody tonight. Uh, Mark, if you or Lily wanted to begin the meeting officially, I'm ready to go. Okay. <laughs> Everybody, tonight we're going to follow the Sierra Club model to explore, enjoy, and protect. So we're going to explore butterflies, we're going to enjoy them flutter by, and we're going to protect them from us. And I want to thank you, Chuck, for taking notes. Who else can, especially action items such as critical habitats to save from development, invasives, and harvesting. <laughs> Okay, anybody else? Uh, thank you, Chuck. And anybody else who takes notes, we can share them at the end. Uh, Rick is next. And uh, everybody put your questions and answers. Uh, Rick said to put them in the chat and also in the question and answer box. And he says, we'll, we'll do the Q and A's mostly at the end. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate uh, being able to spend time with you this, this evening. What I'm going to do is uh, give a little introduction to myself first, and then I'm going to be sharing a slide section, a slideshow that I've created for this uh, purpose for this evening. Um, I want to, again, encourage people to ask me questions in the chat. I won't be able to type the questions back to you, but I have my iPad running so I can see the questions as they show up in chat, which I wouldn't be able to do when I'm sharing the screen and showing the uh, slideshow for this evening. So if you have questions, put them in the uh, chat uh, function and I'll be able to answer them verbally as we go along. I wanted to thank everyone for their interest in butterflies. First of all, uh, I I came to the University of Maryland now going on 40 years ago um, to study well, to study spiders. First of all, frankly, I, I was really interested in spiders. I came here as part of the inaugural Maryland Center for Systematic Entomology program at the University of Maryland, and that's a joint program, or was at the time, between the Smithsonian, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the University of Maryland. Uh, and I came here to study spiders, and unfortunately, the person I came here to study them with, I arrived, I think, the second week of August. The third week of August, he had a massive heart attack and died, uh, and that was um, unfortunate for him, unfortunate for me, unfortunate for spiders, but it meant that I had to find another mentor and for my graduate program and some probably another area to, to begin to think about looking at. So they decided that I was going to um, do a study on some plant coevolution activities uh, with butterflies, not necessarily butterflies, with herbivores, um, insect herbivores, things that eat plants. And so I rapidly signed up for that. I was very excited. Um, that was probably the first week in September, third week in September, my mentor died, um, sure. heart attack again. And I was going to realizing I'm going to have a hard time finding a third mentor because I was getting this, uh, this, this curse associated with me. So I wasn't getting any, anyone to, uh, to sign me up. So what they did was they gave me the research of someone else who had already died to finish. So they figured that would, uh, would do the curse. And that's what I did. And I've been studying butterflies and their evolution and the coevolution with, uh, uh, with the plants that they both feed on and use for nectar resources and use for habitat uh, ever since. Although <clears throat> I pretty quickly left the, uh, the actual entomology program uh, at the graduate level uh, to study science communication and science writing and, and science and policy advocacy. And I've been doing that ever since. I'm currently the the, the Director of Communications and Public Affairs 
for the U.S. Department of uh, Energy's Office of Science. We do about $7 billion worth of basic science every year. Uh, among that basic science is biology and environmental research, and I'm right at home in that activity and really enjoy the work that I do there. But a lot of my interest and my passion in butterflies is reflected also in the communications work that I do. I do a lot of work with the Audubon Naturalist Society, and I see several people in the chat room tonight who are alumni of my uh, workshops uh, at the Audubon Naturalist Society or participants in field trips that I've led before, or just very good uh, close friends who've uh, joined me on field expeditions. And I hope we'll be able to get to doing those field expeditions again this season. What I'm gonna do now is I'm going to, to share uh, my screen. And when I share my screen, that means that you'll be able to see if all works well. Uh, you'll be able to see my slideshow and I will make that slideshow large and in display mode. <clears throat> and you should be able to see all of the, uh, my slide now should be on, on there and you should be able to see a title slide that says, Maryland Butterflies of Conservation Concern. And does everybody see that? If not, let me know. Yes. In the chat, excellent. So I want to ask uh, uh, the, the first question, and we have another poll coming up um, in a second, but I want to ask the first question without a poll, and that is, who can tell me, you can just shout this out in verbally instead of putting on chat, what the butterfly that I have on our first title slide is? Baltimore so, checker yeah. spot. Baltimore checker spot, so named because it has a very, uh, characteristic black and orange pattern and checker spot because it belongs to a group of butterflies called checker spots. So is this an endangered species in Maryland? Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm waiting till I hear the right answer. It is not endangered in Maryland. It's threatened. It's not endangered. Oh, threatened. Yeah, okay. It is threatened. And we'll talk about the differences between that in a little bit. It's a, it's a species of conservation concern. And really what I wanna talk about, I'm, I'll be talking primarily about endangered butterflies, but we'll also talk about some of the butterflies of other uh, conservation concern as we, as we work through the evening. And again, if, if you have questions, please do put them in the chat box and, and every now and then I'll look over there and see that I have something to respond to and I'll try to respond to that. Uh, I've, I've typed in here in the uh, blue line, the luplog.wordpress.com. That's the place you can always find me. That's the site of the blog that I do. Uh, it's about butterfly observation, butterfly field work, butterfly field research. I also manage MD Leps Odes, which is a Google group. <clears throat> and anyone's welcome to join that as well. Uh, <clears throat> it's two, two easy ways to keep in touch with the Maryland uh, Mid-Atlantic, actually, butterfly field community. So as I said, I'm, I'm going to be talking primarily about uh, <laughs> rare, threatened, endangered butterflies. Uh, and I'm going to be talking primarily out of the December 2016 listing by the state of the butterflies that are rare, threatened, or endangered. And I think at this point, we're going to ask Lily to put up the next poll. <clears throat> And I have to say that you know, while, while we're doing that, and while you fill this one out, how many endangered butterfly species are there in Maryland? Endangered butterfly species, let me know. And while you're filling that out, I'll just say that you know, our awareness of these things and our ability to determine what is endangered or threatened or of conservation concern in uh, Maryland is always changing because we're learning so much more about these things and especially we're learning more about them as citizen and community scientists, scientists like yourself, join me in the field to help figure out where they are, how, where they occur and how often they occur. So I'm seeing that most of you believe, well, some of you believe that there are no endangered butterfly species in Maryland. Some of you think there are, you know, a lot, 61. I'll tell you that they're only probably realistically somewhere in the order of about 115 butterfly species you could conceivably run across in Maryland. I did a Maryland butterfly big year in 2013, 
And we really killed ourselves to reach 100. I actually got to 105, and that's a record that has not been beaten yet. I know, fortunately, all butterfly species in Maryland are not endangered, although there's every reason to believe that if we continue the way we're going, that eventually all butterflies will be threatened at some level. Uh, they'll be of conservation concern, but they're not endangered yet. And in fact, some of the, uh, some of the critters that are gonna be talking about tonight that are endangered probably don't deserve to be there anymore, not because we've done anything right, but because we've, our understanding and our awareness of them has changed. Those of you who said that there are 13 endangered butterflies in Maryland are correct. That's the number of actual butterflies that have been met the criteria to be listed uh, by the state of Maryland as endangered and in need of conservation action to prevent their extirpation. Extirpation meaning they be um, eliminated from Maryland. Now there are no butterflies in Maryland that we consider only in Maryland. Um, so all of our butterfly species are found somewhere else. If they were to become extirpated in Maryland, it's unlikely they would be extirpated anywhere else or go extinct because they do uh, exist in other places. Nevertheless, we have a number of butterflies that are very close to the brink in Maryland, and we're going to be talking about them uh, in the next couple of uh, next couple of minutes or so. So let me put that out of the way. Right, there's our poll, <clears throat> and then so I want to just briefly go over the categories here. When I talk about what is endangered, this is what I mean, that it's the species that is about to wink out of, out of the place. The continued existence of this critter is uh, you know, as a viable component of the fauna is about to end. Now that doesn't mean that sometimes you may have butterflies that appear here for a season. Let's say canna skippers, which come up now regularly every summer on canna plants that are imported from Florida, where they're very common. And in fact, they'll call canna skippers there and they're a, a horticultural nursery pest. Um, here, they're really cool because we don't have them, but they can't survive the winter. So they were never actually going to be a species that has a viable component of our fauna. But that's the kind of thing that we would see there. And we see a number of these migrants and we see a number of these accidentals. And sometimes I'll be talking to you about what it's an accidental species and why that really doesn't qualify as endangered. Threatened is something that's likely to become endangered. So we have this sort of sliding slope, slippery slope here that this species might be able to slide into the endangered area. And in need of conservation in general is an animal spot population who is so limited that you might be able, you might see it rec regularly uh, or within some period of time moving into threatened or endangered uh, levels. And then of course we have the endangered or extirpated species, which we just will not see unless we reintroduce them or unless they reintroduce themselves. And that has happened, I have to say from time to time. So Maryland currently has 42 species of conservation concern, generally speaking, uh, and 13 of those are listed as endangered. That's according to the 2016 list. And I'm gonna go through all of these a uh, couple of, um, up front, I'm going to go through all 13 of these and tell you a little bit about them. Uh, one is accidental and probably never did uh, breed in, the, uh, in, in Maryland, and we'll talk about that one. That's Compton tortoiseshell. Two are likely at the very periphery of their edge already, and whether they ever were a viable component of the Maryland fauna is very much in question, um, but they certainly didn't have robust breeding populations here. And one is on the list because we never see it. It doesn't mean it's not common, or at least not at least more common than we think it is, and too common to be considered on the endangered species list. But it's so hard to see that we don't really know enough about it. So we will probably continue to keep that on the endangered species list until we know more. Four of these 13 species are likely already extirpated, and all of them are skippers. So skippers are a special kind of butterfly. I keep thinking of them as butterflies that don't have as much PR as the regular butterflies do. But skippers are, for those of you who've been through my classes, you know they are the hardest of butterflies to identify for the most part. Uh, but they're also ones we don't know as much about. Uh, they almost all feed on some, most of them feed on some kind of grasses. Uh, and since we don't know that much about grasses and because our awareness of grass taxonomy is not very good. We don't know a lot about the, 
uh, the kinds of things they feed on and when they do that. So Compton tortoise shells, the first one I want to talk about. This is the one, you know, is a it's a northern butterfly. It's a what we call circumboreal. You find it all the way across the uh, high reaches of North America, down into the Appalachian spine for some some ways, into the Rockies, across all the way to Alaska and in the Maritimes. But it's a Northwoods butterfly. And from time to time, you'll see these showing up in Green Ridge State Forest, sometimes in Garrett County. Uh, and there was this belief that they that they um, bred there, that they laid their eggs there, that they matured there. It really probably is not the, was not the case ever. Uh, these these are highly migratory. So many of the butterflies in this group, the angle wings, are migratory, or at least very strong flyers. And so you'll see them show up very far from where they actually hatched out or it closed. And they'll wander widely in search of larval food plants. Uh, in this case, they're mostly nettles. Uh, and Compton tortoiseshell can uh, travel south in order to find nettles that are up if they happen to emerge early, too early for nettles to be up in, say, Pennsylvania, uh, where they're much more likely to be seen. They'll move their way down here in search of, uh, of forage. The same way that the monarchs go north, the Compton tortoiseshell will go south. We see them less and less often, probably because of climate change and global warming now. We don't see them nearly as often as we used to. Uh, in Green Ridge State Forest, although they are not of conservation concern practically anywhere else uh, in the United States. And this is a pattern that we'll see a for a lot of these things, things that we think are rare, we immediately think of are endangered. That does not necessarily mean they're endangered. It means that they're rare, but they probably don't actually belong in our fauna as a regular uh, item in the fauna anyway. <clears throat> uh, I want to talk about two hair streaks now. Um, the, the, possibly three hair streaks here, even there are only two pictures. Hair streaks are a particular kind of butterfly. They're small, they're called lysenids or gossamer wings because their wings are very delicate. And they're called hair streaks, of course, because of these little projections that most of them have coming out of their uh, uh, eye spots or out of the, the ends of their uh, ventral wings. Uh, and I wanna talk about the, the oak hair streak and the hickory hair streak. I'll take the hickory hair streak first uh, because it's the easiest one. Hickory hair streak feeds on only on hickory and primarily on shagbark hickory, uh, which is not well distributed in Maryland. And this has been seen very, very, very seldom in Maryland. Uh, hickory hair streak begins to show up more in northern New Jersey and New York and parts of Pennsylvania and then up through the through New England. It's a northern butterfly again. When we see it here, it's at the very edge of its boundaries uh, and probably can't tolerate the warm and hot summers here the way uh, that many of our satyrium butterflies can, satyrium hair streaks. These are all in the genus satyrium. So uh, I think it's probably safe to say that hickory hair streak is not probably a good candidate for conservation concern here in Maryland because there's really nothing we could do to keep it as a viable part of our fauna. It's really a, a species that is uh, probably never was very robust in Maryland to begin with. We have maybe one or two or um, contemporary records for this butterfly, mostly in Garrett County or the Western counties. Now, the oak hair streak, on the other hand, um, is, a, is a different kind of critter. Uh, oak hair streak is widely distributed in, uh, in the United States. And I have a little poll here uh, to ask you about how hair, what hair streaks do with those little tails that are on the back of their um, wings before we move on to uh, talking about the oak hair streaks. So why do hair streak butterflies have those tails? Do they have them to protect against bird predators? Do they have them to attract a mate in some way? Do they have them protect against spider predators? Do they have them to serve as rudders when they're flying or otherwise help them with flying? Folks who've taken my Audubon Naturalist Society course are not eligible here because we talk about this in my class. Luckily, I can see most of you haven't taken that class. So I'll give you just another 20 seconds or so to uh, fill out the poll. Hair streaks are among my favorite butterflies. We have a number of species. Many of them are of conservation concern, um, but most of them are, some of the more common ones are beautiful and very easy uh, to see. 
All right. Um, those of you who think that it's to protect against bird predators, that's the overwhelming majority of you. Um, not really, probably not true. And this is what we used to believe. So it's not surprising. A lot of people still believe mm -hmm. that's the case. You know, hair streaks are kind of small. They wouldn't make much of a meal for a bird in the first place. But they're also probably not designed to do that. And when you see these butterflies in nature, you'll often see them uh, sitting on a leaf and they'll be turning their tails. And those little, those little um, uh, hair streaks, those little hairs look like antennae on the top on the end of their um, end of their abdomen. So that when something does strike that area, it means that they're going to miss the head and just get a mouthful of scales. Um, they don't really use them to attract a mate and they don't really serve much of a function as rudders or in flight. But what we recently come to discover is they're a super effective uh, protection against spiders. Jumping spiders are the biggest predator for hair streaks. And jumping spiders in particular will see that eye spot and see that little antennae moving and they'll go straight for the head or what they think is the head. And when they hit that uh, end, of the, end of the wing, the butterfly just flies off. A super effective way of protecting against uh, spiders. <clears throat> and I'm going to go, Lily, I'm, gonna, I'm going to uh, take your question in a second about the impact of non-native invasive species on Maryland butterflies. I will say, if you're talking about non-native butterfly species, there really hasn't been an impact. Uh, if you're talking about non-native invasive plant species, pretty much big impact, and we can talk about that in a little bit. <clears throat> so here's the curious situation with oak hair streak. Oak hair streak shows up in two different, um, two different buckets, I guess you would say. Uh, so if you look on this map, the orange dots are the dots where we have real verified contemporary records. The purple dots are where we have old records, primarily site records of people who've said they've seen this or recorded that they've seen this, this critter. Uh, and you'll see that most of them are either in the south or the orange ones and most of the other orange, orange ones are in the north. In fact, if you follow those orange ones of the north up, uh, there'd be even more of them up and farther in New England. What's happened is there's been this complete hollowing out of the middle of this range. And that tells me two things. One, it tells me um, that's kind of odd because, you know, oak hair streaks feed on a lot of different kinds of oaks. There's no real reason why they, you know, would be hollowed out this way. More likely, the southern oak hair streak, which is the one we were most likely to see, um, uh, I, I believe, uh, at least in the southern parts of the state, the southern oak hair streak looks a lot like our other hair streaks and so it would have been misidentified. So does Northern Oak Hair Streak, looks a lot like our other butterflies and people with wishful thinking, uh, thinking, oh, I saw a Northern Oak Hair Streak, probably didn't. They probably saw one of our more common species. And since most of these records aren't backed up by actual specimens in a collection, and this was before iNaturalist and this was before Mar uh, Maryland Biodiversity Project, the likelihood is that these are mostly errors. The one that you see over the M in Maryland, the orange dot is real. I do know that one um, <clears throat> and observed that one actually, uh, and it was real. On the other hand, there's no way of knowing how it got there. Did it get there because it was breeding in the area or like many butterflies and Gulf Fritillary is one of them that, uh, that, that does this often, they hitchhike. The larva drops down, spins a cocoon or spins a chrysalis, builds its cocoon uh, on the car, on the camper, in your tent. And then when you when you pitch your tent in Green Ridge State Forest, then this thing emerges and you think, oh my goodness, we now have Northern Oak Hair Streak in Maryland. Probably not. And it probably, probably never really existed here in any numbers and certainly doesn't now and probably doesn't deserve the conservation concern uh, the, or the resources that would go with conservation concern. <clears throat> Early hair streak is one of the butterflies that I love talking about more than any other. It's one of the most beautiful butterflies. I've seen it once in Massachusetts. I've never seen it in Maryland. There are only a handful of records in Maryland. And when you see it, it is a stunner. It is an absolute stunner. The problem is you never see it. 
You never see it because it stays in the very tops of trees, primarily beech trees in Maryland, although in some parts of New England, it feeds on beaked uh, hazelnut and some other plants. Uh, but here it's only in Maryland. The only time you will ever see this is, is when the males come down to the ground to do what the one on the left is doing, which is to take up salt ions, which it then uh, stores in its sperm and is transmitted to the female a, it makes his sperm more effective, and B, it makes her eggs more uh, viable when he's able to transmit those. But it's only the males who come down and do that. You never see, and you see how what it might seem, because this is a big picture here, it might seem that that's a hard thing to miss if you're walking through the woods. Trust me, it's a very hard thing to see. They're almost always on this very grayish, greenish colored uh, uh, substrate. So when you see them, it's really hard. It's really hard to figure out what they are. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, model dusky wing. It's one of the skippers again. Skippers are butterflies that that have a different sort of a lifestyle. They tend to be much more frenetic, much more frantic. Uh, they fly around, um, generally speaking, much more and, and skip around. That's how they get their name. Uh, they're often larger. They have wings that are more fixed and not quite as flexible. You'll see on this one too, on the left on the left hand side, sitting on, a, on one of the phloxes. I took this picture actually in uh, Crex Wildlife Management Area in Wisconsin a couple of years ago on a butterfly trip out there. You'll see that its antenna are hooked. They they come to a club, which is true of all butterflies, and then it hooks. That's one of the things that differentiates butterflies from moths is that clubbed antenna. So the skipper has the clubbed antenna and a hook. And that hook is very characteristic of skippers. Model dusky wing used to be seen in Maryland quite frequently, um, it, it, particularly in the western counties and particularly in shale barrens and particularly in Green Ridge State Forest, uh, which is an area of special concern for me and special interest to me. Uh, has not been seen in the state for some decades now, um, pro probably because its primary host plant, which is on the right, which is New Jersey tea or Ceanothus, uh, has been hit really hard by two particular problems in Maryland. Anyone want to tell me what those particular problems are? New Jersey tea. Climate change. <laughs> Climate change hasn't really been much of an issue. It's found throughout the, um, the Appalachians and well into some of the southern states, so it's not and it's uh, found up into the into New England as well. So it's a widely distributed plant. Development? Development. Development is not really that much of a problem. Although we have lost some of these, uh, <clears throat> some of these colonies and populations to uh, mm -hmm. roadsides and, and road building, that certainly is an issue. Deer. You know, the real problem, deer, yes. They are, they are, mm -hmm. they are catnip to deer. Deer love to eat these more than anything else. They will wipe these out wherever they can get to them. So where you see them now is usually on roadsides that have a slope. Uh, you see some of these in Green Ridge, but never in the kind of numbers that will support a population of butterflies. And, and I hear this a lot that, you know, oh, I have, I planted turtle head in my garden. I have three plants, but I still don't have any, any Baltimore checker spots. Well, no, you're not going to either. You really need habitats which are rich in their food plants not just one food plant every mile and a half. Uh, and that's sort of the issue with the model dusky wing. We don't have enough New Jersey tea now to support a viable population. Another skipper, two-spotted skipper, uh, one of my favorite ones. I took this picture uh, at, in one of the Chicago suburbs actually, because I can't, we can't find them in Maryland anymore. I can find them about 30 miles uh, into West Virginia is the last population. It's been seen there within the last five years, uh, but not in Maryland itself. And here's one of the reasons why. <clears throat> it feeds on this critter called hairy fruited sedge. And hairy fruited sedge has a very limited population and distribution in Maryland, mostly in Carroll, in the Carroll, Baltimore sort of ish area there. And the consequence of that is that we never, we're never seeing it on the east side of the state. The only place we've ever seen it is in, uh, um, uh, the only place we've ever seen it actually is in, uh, is in the western part of the state. The only recent descriptions or observations we've seen have actually been in Garrett County. 
So one of the things you're going to notice in the conversations tonight is how closely tied the populations of the butterflies are with their very specific niche plants. That's true also of Chermox mulberry wing. Chermox mulberry wing is one of the most recent butterflies to be described in science in Maryland. And in fact, this butterfly was described from Newbridge Road in Dorchester County, uh, just south of Blackwater Wildlife Ref uh, National Wildlife Refuge. And Chermox mulberry wing is a subspecies as best we could tell uh, from the regular mulberry wing, which is also a species of conservation concern, but not endangered, uh, which is a resident of um, marshes and, and bogs and, and you know, somewhat wooded swamps with, see it with um, button bush and uh, tussock sedge, Carex stricta. Carex stricta is well widely distributed <clears throat> and where we, we used to find Chermox mulberry wing and it's only been seen a handful of times. It hasn't been seen in the last decade. Uh, the, the place where it was originally collected from in uh, Dorchester County, two problems there. Uh, one, Dorchester County believes that every roadside should look like a golf course. So they go do their very level best to mow everything to the tree line. And that includes most of the Carex stricta. And what they don't get sea level rise has gotten. So there's a lot more flooding in that area now and Carex stricta can't stand to be flooded that much. So we're losing the butterfly, we're losing the plant. Even when the plant still remains, the butterfly crawls down to the bottom of the plant in the evenings so it doesn't get uh, fed on or predated quite as much. Uh, and when it does, it drowns along with the plant. Mm -hmm. So Chermox mulberry wing, for all we know, may be extinct uh, completely but it certainly is probably extirpated in Maryland. It's a beautiful little butterfly. These are about the size of, oh, a half dollar or so. And then one of my favorites that I still hold hope for uh, here in Maryland, the Appalachian grizzled skipper, which used to be very common in Green Ridge State Forest on shale barrens. This one's sitting on a shale barren in Virginia near Covington in one of the last remaining large holdouts for this in a shale barrens area, a very open and expansive shale barren. It feeds on dwarf sink foil, which is a very commonly distributed plant in Maryland. In fact, I took this picture on the left at Patuxent Research Refuge uh, just day before yesterday, so I could have that to show you today. It's blooming now, and that's just when they would be flying. That's when this plant starts to bloom. That's the only larval food source that they have. They can only feed on that plant. Uh, and when you don't have that plant, well, you, you're sort of out of luck. The problem is the plant is very common. So why isn't the Appalachian grizzled skipper? Its last holdout was in Green Ridge State Forest. This is a univoltine butterfly, and you'll find that that's characteristic of many of our endangered species. Univoltine means it only flies once during the year. Other very common butterflies, like some of our swallowtails, like cabbage whites, uh, like sulfurs, all of these butterflies have multiple broods during the year. So, so what you, you, you know, you freeze one brood, they'll come back. They can build up again. With Appalachian grizzled skipper and other univoltine species, you wipe out that, that, one, that one brood and you wipe this critter out. And that's really what happened at Green Ridge. They were already just barely hanging on because the shale barren habitat there was degraded uh, and forest management there didn't support you know, keeping the, uh, the shale barrens intact the way it should be. What happened then was the final coup de grace, widespread gypsy moth spraying in the 1990s. Those of you who know gypsy moth spraying know that they spray at exactly the, you know, the right time for this butterfly to have laid its eggs and the new caterpillars to have been out, wiped them out completely. Uh, I still hold out some hope that there may be some shale barrens that were not sprayed in that widespread gypsy moth spraying program in the 90s but that hope fades a little bit every year. So what do these four skippers have in common? Well, they're all in niche habitats. They're in shale or serpentine barrens. They're in palustrine meadows, that is meadows with you know, standing water, at least some of the time, uh, wet meadows, coastal sedge marshes, with the exception of the Appalachian grizzle skipper, rare caterpillar food plants. And this is a pattern that we'll see with many other endangered butterflies and species. Uh, in Maryland. And we have another poll coming up here. So let's take another look at the next poll. And 
and the audience is going to tell us here which of the following butterflies, I haven't talked about them all yet, of the ones that are remaining, which of these is endangered in the state of Maryland? Monarch butterfly, West Virginia white, Palamedes swallowtail, or Carner blue? I'll give you just a second to fill that one out. And while you do, I'll, I'll answer, I'll go back and answer Willie's question. So the biggest problem with non-native -inva non invasive species, the best example is West Virginia white, to have that one up here on the screen. West Virginia white used to be well distributed in Western Maryland from Frederick all the way to the Appalachians. Uh, it feeds on various um, uh, crinkle roots or tooth warts, as some of you know them. They're cress, early spring cress blooming now. Uh, and that species that they feed on is distributed widely across Maryland. But about the time that they started to decline would have been, oh, the late 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s. And what we've discovered is that the introduced garlic mustard uh, is probably what's responsible for wiping them out. At first it was thought, and it was a good question of lilies, at first it was thought that they were not able to compete against the European invasive cabbage white. That's a butterfly that came uh, from Europe where it has a perfectly good name already called small white. So sometimes I'll refer to it as small white instead of cabbage white. That turns out not to have been the case. Uh, they really didn't compete particularly. Um, but what's happened is that the the scent and the pheromones and the chemicals that are released by garlic mustard, garlic cress, are more powerful even than those of the toothwort and more attractive to the female West Virginia white, which will prefer to oviposit on those plants wherever they are, and the caterpillars will starve on them. They cannot complete their metamorphosis on garlic cress, garlic mustard. So we call that an oviposition stink. In places where we've been able to eliminate most of the garlic mustard, uh, in places, for example, around the Big Run and Savage Forest, uh, we have seen the return of cabbage white. Um, but it's still a very, very um, uh, unusual finding, although it is not endangered. It is a species of conservation concern, but not endangered. Carner blue butterfly is an endangered species. It just doesn't happen to be in Maryland. So uh, Carner blue is a, a Butterfly mostly found north, north and west and east of here. Monarch butterfly, some people think are endangered. And in fact, there is a petition to list them as federally endangered. And that may well be for some of the Western populations and possibly some of the Midwestern populations. They are not endangered or even a particular conservation concern in the Eastern United States. Uh, our, our monitoring of the species moving through Cape May in particular, which is where they stage before flying over the bay, uh, has shown that their numbers have been relatively stable for several decades now. Uh, and when, because we're not seeing them here in the summer does not mean that they're endangered. Uh, it's because they normally move farther north as the next stage of their migration, because that's where the food is more plentiful and that's where the parasites are less plentiful and the predators are less plentiful. The actual answer here is Palamedes swallowtail. Palamedes swallowtail, one of my very favorites, um, and, and we'll move into that when I talk about the rest of the endangered butterflies. And the ones we're gonna talk about are rare skipper, and I'm gonna talk to you about it not being quite so rare, Carolina satyr, which actually is rapidly expanding its range in Maryland now, bog copper, Palamedes swallowtail, and two more of those famous hair streaks. So rare skipper, as I'm saying here, is probably not that rare. It is hard to find, but in the area where you can find it, it is not that uncommon. Rare skipper is a, is a skipper that's found in um, coastal areas with tall vegetation. Uh, and when we look at that, this is what it looks like, its distribution in Maryland. It's only that those two very southern counties uh, where you find it and where it's in that particular mix of interesting uh, tall vegetation in coastal marshes, coastal sedge marshes in particular. It feeds in a plant called cordgrass. And so I thought, oh, well, you know, cordgrass probably has the same distribution as the butterfly since they seem to be so closely tied together. But no, when you look at cordgrass, it's widely distributed in Maryland. So what gives here? We, we really don't know why this butterfly is only restricted to those two southern counties 
when it's hard, larval host plant is found all over the state. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a perplexing thing. We don't know enough about the butterfly. We don't know enough about its habitats and its habits uh, to be able to say for sure why it is of conservation concern. All we know is that it is of conservation concern. It is endangered, um, not so much because it's um, um, because it is, it is threatened by anything in particular, although I suspect that continued water rise and sea level rise in those two counties will have the same damaging effect that it had on Termox mulberry wing. But we see some signs of hope. I did uh, see this butterfly this summer for the first time uh, up in Kent County, Eastern Neck Wildlife Refuge. So it does have some ability to, to be around. It's not a hard thing. It's not an easy thing to see and find. You only find it often is that the first picture that I showed you there, if I can go back to it, you often find them sitting on uh, Ceanothus or, or Sepalanthus, the button bush. It's just their favorite thing. And if you look at this butterfly on the left, uh, you'll notice it has a big black spot in the middle of an orange wing. That's characteristic of rare skipper. Carolina satyr is another really good example of, of, of sort of evolution in action and of something the community and civic scientists can do to help us uh, sort of figure out what's going on with our butterflies. Carolina satyr was unknown in Maryland, was unknown completely until relatively recently when it was described in the South. Um, and it looks a lot like our little wood satyr, which many of you see. And most of when you see little wood satyr, it looks exactly like the butterfly on the left, except it has a couple of bigger spots on the on the forewings. And of course, when it's spread out like it is on the right with its wings spread, which you never see them like this in the field, I'm amazed at whoever took that picture. Uh, when you see these kind of pictures in this butterfly, you'll note that you know it doesn't have any of those eye spots on the, on the upper side. So you can pretty much tell this is a Carolina satyr. It was first discovered in Maryland in, uh, on the Western shore, um, Calvert County. Uh, where it continues to exist. But since then, it has been seen in several counties in Maryland, including Garrett County, and it continues to expand its way northward. It is a butterfly that, because of climate change, is rapidly expanding. It's a very common butterfly in the south. We thought it might be endangered because there were so few of them. In fact, uh, we were just seeing the beginning of a migration push uh, for this butterfly. This is its... My, this is its... Uh, uh, its uh, range now, it goes all the way up now into New Jersey, uh, all of Delaware, into Ohio, well into Pennsylvania. And I think last year were the first year, was the first year it's actually been reported from Maryland, uh, from uh, New York. Bog copper, not so much. Bog copper truly deserves the moniker of an endangered species. It's endangered for two reasons, one, um, two interchangeable, intertwined reasons. Bog copper feeds only on the plant on the right here, which is small or dwarf cranberry, which is only found in relic bogs, um, primarily the perched uh, boreal bogs that were left over after the last ice age. It's univoltine, only shows up in the middle of the summer, uh, usually for about two weeks in early July when this plant is blooming. It's tied completely to this plant in its, uh, uh, in its behavior and its habitat and its in ecology. The larvae feed on it, the adult, as, uh, as caterpillars, the adults feed on the flowers almost exclusively. If you don't have this plant, you don't have this butterfly. And as a consequence, this is the only place you're gonna find them in Maryland. Um, and and I, I would have to shoot you if I told you where the two populations we know of in Maryland are. The most easy, the easiest place to see them is just across the West Virginia um, border from Maryland in Cranesville Bog on the West Virginia side where along the boardwalk in the first two weeks of July, you have a very good chance of seeing this butterfly, which unfortunately for us is so well camouflaged, it's really hard to pick out. It's small, it doesn't move around very much, it looks just like the leaves uh, that it perches on. But there are at least two populations in bogs in Maryland uh, that field work by me and a couple of other colleagues uh, uncovered just a couple of years ago. And some folks from the uh, Department of Natural Resources were working on that as well. Palamedes swallowtail, the one we've just been talking about. I like to think about this as the one with the racing stripe, the racing stripe going up, going down here. This is characteristic of Palamedes swallowtail. 
Palamedes swallowtail is uh, found in a lot of Maryland, but only breeds in one specific place in Maryland, in the Pocomoke drainage um, on Hickory Point Road, uh, very close to Pocomoke City. That's where the only populations of any note are of the plant that it feeds on, uh, which is a type of bay, it's Persia. This is Swamp Bay. Some of you may know Red Bay. Red Bay and Swamp Bay are very common in the South. Um, and the Sweet Bay or Swamp Bay uh, is found only in these maybe five populations or so in the southern part of the state in those two counties. Um, uh, it's a very uncommon plant. It's in the Laurel family. And we may be one of the last refuges of this plant because, well, let me just say first, the, um, the Palamedes swallowtail, even though it's only breeds in those two counties, strong flyer. You can see it in much of Maryland. We just got a really good picture last year of one in Baltimore. Strong flyer, very distinctive, but it only breeds in those two counties, which is why it's an endangered species. If we're actually breeding all these counties, the likelihood would be not considered endangered. But it's endangered because of the scarcity of its host plant and because of the red bay ambrosia beetle. So red bay ambrosia beetle was uh, introduced in the United States somewhere around hmm, 15, 20 years ago. And already it has wrought such devastation in the ecosystem in many of the swamps of the south that it has brought the Palamedes swallowtail to its knees in many of its former uh, redoubts. It was, it's a very common southern butterfly. It's only uncommon here because it, we're at the very northern end of its range, not because the butterfly couldn't survive, but because sweet bay uh, can't survive here and red bay can't survive here. What happens is this little ambrosia beetle requires its host to be infected with the fungus. So it deliberately infects these plants, red bay and sweet bay, um, with this fungus, which is fatal. And they feed on the decaying plant as it dies from the fungus. Highly aggressive, almost impossible to control. We may be so far north that the beetle can survive here. That's a good possibility. And so we may be the, one of the last strongholds for Palamedes swallowtail. It's never very common, but you can see it along Hickory Point Road, uh, just outside of Pocomoke City, uh, several times during the year. This is a, uh, a, a multi-bolting or multi-brooded a butterfly. King's hair streak found in much the same area actually. It has the same kind of a situation with its host plant, which is a sweet leaf or a beaver tree uh, or horse sugar. Sometimes this plant is called a very unusual plant, distributed very little, again, fewer than five active locations. King's hair streak feeds on this plant and this plant alone. Oops. This plant and this plant alone, and it has the same basic distribution uh, as the breeding, uh, breeding grounds for, um, uh, for Palamedia swallowtail. This is the hardest butterfly of our butterflies to see. When I did my Maryland 100 year, the big butterfly big year in 2013, it took me six trips to the Eastern shore to see this butterfly. It flies for a very short period of time like many hair streaks, it only flies in the very early morning. The males come down and even the females come down for a little bit un until about nine o'clock in the morning. And then they're back up in the canopy of the trees like many hair streaks are. So you can only have a very limited period of time to see them and its habitat is so restricted. I know of only one regular colony that uh, we could see these things at and we're still trying to studying that, trying to figure out what the population dynamics there are. Edwards hair streak, much the same situation, except that here's its host plant on the right-hand side. Anyone want to shout out and tell me what kind of oak that is? <clears throat> so fairly widely distributed oak. You notice it has those spines or tips on the leaves. Bear oak. Bear oak or post oak, Quercus elisifolia. Um, and if you look at where the Edwards hair streak is, Edwards hair streak is not very well distributed in Maryland. Um, this is this is its historical uh, uh, distribution. That is um, where we've seen now. Again, we have now only probably five active colonies of 
Edwards hair streak. And this is really surprising because this is the distribution of Barrow. So what the heck is going on here? Very common host plant, very uncommon butterfly, made us think, gosh, what's going on here? This is what's going on here. We're, we need to be more concerned about the population of the ants that are mutualistic inhabitants with these, butter, with these butterfly larvae. And it requires very specific habitat requirements. That is a lot of open space between the small um, uh, bear oaks, which can only be about three or four feet tall. Uh, because if they get taller than that, the butterflies can't feed because the, the larva goes down to the ground during the daytime and only feeds at night. So if it's a very tall oak, it can't make it up into the tree to feed, and it has to be associated with these ants. And we don't know enough about the species of ants that are required to maintain this symbiotic relationship. But what we do know is where there are no none of the right species of ants, you will not find Edward's hair streak. So the folks who did some uh, habitat reconstruction in Soldier's Delight about a decade ago, there was a very good colony of Edwards Hair Street there. They wanted to remove a good portion of the bare oak because it was crowding out some other more important, to, to botanically important uh, endangered plant species. They knew there was plenty of bare oak down the, down the hollow just a little bit, more mature trees. They took out, took out the small bare oak and the colony never recovered. It, uh, it went extinct in that area, extirpated from soldiers' delight. So it's unintended consequences, and it's always trade-offs between one endangered species for another. I want to talk to you and end sort of here on a, on a positive note, a temporary, at least, conservation success story uh, involving a species that I've been studying very closely for the last decade, Olympia marble. Olympia marble is a relative of cabbage white. It's a small butterfly, about the size of a quarter. Um, it flies with falcate orange tip, which is a very close relative and a very common butterfly. It's found when we're seeing it now, we're seeing it again in Green Ridge State Forest. The female on the left uh, is ovipositing on a rock cress. The male on the right is just sort of hanging out here after having been in my net and gotten freaked out. Um, but then sort of sat there and, uh, and recovered for a little bit enough for us to take some really good photographs. This is the interesting thing about the Olympia marble, Euchloe Olympia. <clears throat> Let me just back up and say the reason they get the name marble, if I can make myself go back here, well, I'll take the next picture, is, the, is that really strong vein look on the, uh, sort of the green marbling on the underside of the wing, those characteristic of the marbles. When you look at the, the, the distribution of, of um, Olympia marble, there are two big pockets. There's uh, all those ones that are in the left-hand side. All the, all the ones in the middle of the country, all those butterflies are either in prairies or very light woods, very dry woods, uh, and they feed on cardamine and cresses the same way any, anything else, but a wide variety of cresses um, across the vast majority of the United States. But then you look at our little patch of Olympia marbles. They are only found on shale barrens, and they pretty much only feed on rock crests, uh, lyrate rock crests uh, to be specific. And right now we can only find them in Green Ridge State Forest, where they used to be very common. In fact, when I was a graduate student in the University of Maryland, we used to take spring collecting trips up into the Green Ridge. And we always saw this butterfly. It was very common. So was Appalachian grizzled skipper at that time. Uh, and it turns out, don't wanna go there yet. It turns out that these butterflies were very, very common, um, but, they, but they were already, we didn't know it at the time, but they were already on their way out. And they were on their way out because of the characteristics that they are associated with. And one of the characteristics they're associated with is that they are part of a shale barren ecology. So I wanna talk a little bit about shale barrens and I wanna test your knowledge about shale barrens. And so that's what I'm gonna ask Lily to bring up the next poll about shale barrens. Where I'm gonna ask you which of the following are characteristics, critical characteristics of a shale barren? Is it that they have poor nutrient quality? 
They're on a very steep slope. They require periodic burns to maintain them, or they have fragile surfaces that are easily damaged by foot traffic. Which of these are critical components of shale barrens? I hope many of you have been able to see the shale barren in, the, or some shale barrens in Green Ridge State Forest. There's one that's been um, acquired by, by the Nature Conservancy uh, in Old Town, right downtown in Old Town, frankly. Uh, it's a, a very, uh, very cool um, uh, purchase by them. Right now, it does not have, as far as I can tell, it has neither Appalachian Grizzle Skipper nor Olympia Marble, but it's a good candidate for reintroduction. <clears throat> So a lot of you are right that the fragile surface is very easily damaged by foot traffic. And so when I take people to see Olympia marble on surface on places where they are known in the shale barrens, we very seldom actually go onto the shale barren itself. And if you go to Green Ridge to see Olympia marble, I would encourage you not to walk on the shale barrens because that's a very hard, it's a very easy place to damage, um, particularly with uh, high, heavy, hiker, heavy hiker feet. They do require periodic burns to maintain them also. Uh, so they typically will disappear if uh, allowed to, to go through succession. They have very poor nutrient quality because they retain no water and everything just washes right through and takes all the nutrients with them. And they are, this is a, really probably the most characteristic of them. They are always on a steep slope, 30% slope or better. And that's what characterizes a shale barren. Good job, everybody. So wait a minute, they were all correct? They were every one of them correct. <laughs> okay, thanks. I didn't tell you that they that you had to choose only one. They were all correct. Every one. I could have made it that way. <laughs> yeah. It, it, didn't, it, it didn't accept more than one answer. Yeah. No, it wouldn't have put, it only accepted all of yeah, them. I, I, I tried to do all four. <laughs> you had to decide, you had to decide which was most important to you. For me, it's the steep slope. Because you can find areas with poor nutrient qualities, they require periodic burns, and they're easily damaged. But the thing that's characteristic about the uh, um, shale barrens is it has to be on this kind of a steep slope. This is the slope on the right, well, both of them actually are, uh, from the um, Carroll Road Overlook uh, on Carroll Road in Green Ridge State Forest. It's called Point Overlook. It overlooks the Potomac here. And the butterflies breed in the uh, slopes here on rock cress. I think I may have a picture of rock cress that's blooming right now. This is lyrate rock cress, Arabidopsis lyrata. And it is the preferred host plant for the caterpillars. And it's scattered throughout Green Ridge, but most of it occurs on those steep slopes, probably because of something that has to do with the, the combination of poor nutrient quality and the fast drainage. Uh, and the lack of competition from other uh, other critters. And this is critical for the Olympian marble, although I have observed it of a positing a couple of times in other cresses, in particular hairy bitter cress, I've never seen the caterpillars uh, make their way to adulthood on that. Here again, fire suppression and succession are killers for uh, shale barrens. This is a former shale barren along um, Picklick Road that used to be a prime habitat for Olympia marble, no longer. You no longer find Olympia marbles in this area because Lyrata doesn't grow there. And I think because there's something that has to do with those warm, steep facing, western, southern facing slopes, these things are flying now. And so in order to fly now and get the jump on other species uh, that might outcompete them, and when the rock press is in bloom, they need to be able to, to warm up. And the temperatures on those south facing steep slopes are sometimes 20 or 30 degrees higher than they are. And when you put uh, in the ambient air around them and when you put trees over that, you lose all of that. But probably the last straw for these critters was gypsy moth control, the same thing that did, uh, did in the Appalachian grizzled skipper. And we thought we had lost Olympia marble as well. Until in 2010, uh, Jen Selfridge got to, a bunch of us together and we went over all the historical records for Olympia marble and visit all the historical known locations for this butterfly in all of Green Ridge, in fact, all of Great Garrett and uh, all of uh, Allegheny County uh, and came up empty. 
until I finally found a relic population just over the summit of this hill here, we call it Happy Valley, but it's a hell of a hike to get to. Uh, and there were maybe a dozen butterflies there. Uh, and we started working with the Department of Natural Resources and with the Maryland Forestry Service uh, to provide some protection. And now they're keeping this, this, this uh, right of way clear. And that's really critical, I think. Um, unfortunately, because of the way we're, we're damaging a lot of the uh, surrounding ecology, power line right of ways for all their you know, damage to the environment when they're built provide really good refugia for many endangered species. And Olympia marble is one of them. And over the last decade, I'm happy to report that this charismatic little butterfly, notice how beautifully rosy tinged it is when it first emerges, uh, has been common enough that I can actually take people to uh, Green Ridge. Dennis and Lydia in the room have been there with me. Judy's been with me uh, to see uh, these incredible butterflies uh, actually in person, up close and personal. Um, beautiful, beautiful butterfly. And here again is the reason why they're called marbles, that marbling on the, on the hind wing, really characteristic. And when they sit on a lichen covered rock or tree, you would never see them. So where does that leave us? Well, here's my, here's my, my ending slide. Uh, I just wanna talk about really quickly what the priorities might be for endangered butterfly conservation. So one of the first things I would say is stop, stop doing gypsy moth control uh, with Bacillus thuringiensis, the BT, or Dimolin. Dimolin is a chitin inhibitor. That means that uh, if you spray something with Dimolin, it will not form its exoskeleton. It won't form that uh, heavy, hard um, uh, shell. So for insects, and butterflies are insects, they don't have an internal skeleton. Their skeleton is all on the outside. It's like wearing a suit of armor with no bones or anything else on the inside, all the muscles attached to the exoskeleton. So if you can't grow that exoskeleton and Dimolin keeps you from growing an exoskeleton, you're screwed. It has the same impact on crayfish, the same impact on crabs. That's one of the reasons they seldom use Dimolin anymore, but everybody loves BT because it only kills butterfly larvae. Well, I, moth and butterfly larvae caterpillars. Well, guess what? It kills gypsy moth caterpillars, but it also kills Appalachian grizzle skipper. It also kills falcate orange tip. It also kills Olympia marble. It also kills um, silvery, um, silvery blue and many of the others uh, that are of some conservation, control, um, conservation concern. Aggressive deer browse needs to be controlled. In an ideal world, we would restore beaver managed landscapes very critical for many of our endangered butterflies and our butterflies of conservation concern. We desperately need control burns on barrens, both serpentine and shale, to be able to expose that area, make sure that the uh, rock cresses can remain, and make sure that the butterflies can have the areas to do the thermal regulation they need to be that those early emerging uh, butterflies and make their way. Reducing the mowing regimes on road, uh, road rights of way, I mean, it, I have to say on the Eastern shore in general, it's the worst situation ever, but it's not like the rest of the state is, you know, can, can go home and say, oh, we've done a great job because much of rural Maryland, the, the, the way that we keep the roads is to keep it, at, you know, so you can play croquet on the roadside. Meadow and marsh habitat restoration and succession of suppression, uh, our uh, suppression of succession is exactly what we need. You know, so many of our meadow and marsh habitats are being overrun by shrubs and trees and people think, oh, let's plant some trees, let's plant a forest. Well, many of our species are not adapted to that and most will die if you don't have meadow and marsh habitat. And lastly, reduced herbicide use on field margins is critical for a number of our species, uh, which use primarily nectar sources that are very abundant at the edge of roads and at the edge of fields but the current landscape management from agribusiness, particularly on the Eastern shore, is to spray right up to the road shoulder so that you, you have an herbicide that kills everything. And then you have mowing that kills everything else. So you have this bare desert that begins at where the asphalt stops until you're into monoculture corn or soybeans. So those are my priorities. That's my wish list uh, for what I would hope that we would be able to do um, to help bring many of these endangered butterflies back, the ones at least we have some hope for. 
Uh, and when you're endangered, there's not a lot of hope. You don't, you don't normally bring butterflies back from endangered status. It's very hard to do. Um, and the easy things, and I'll stop sharing here just to be able to talk to you. The easy thing that we always, almost always talk about, we always say, oh, if I just planted this, oh, it must be, let's plant more milkweed and the monarchs will thrive. Let's do, let's plant more turtle head and the Baltimore checker squats will, will, you know, will thrive. It's almost never the case. There are so many things that go into that, just like the ants with the Edwards hair streak. You have to consider all of the components of their ecosystem in order to bring them back from the brink. And I'll stop there. Happy to take questions. <clears throat> Happy to hear answers if you have them as well. There are two questions that got asked earlier. One was to identify the damselfly at the very beginning. I'm not a damselfly person, but I bet you Judy Gallagher could tell you. What was that, Rick? The the but the uh, two damselflies, the spread wings that were on the cover of the of the uh, of the uh, um, endangered species report. I can bring it back up again. Let me just do that. It's like slide two. It's slide two. It's way back there, but I'll get there quickly. I say confidently, I'll get back there quickly. <laughs> Do you know that one offhand? Um, I'm not seeing your screen, Rick. Oh, should be shared. Let's share the screen again. Is that I can't tell from the size of the picture on the screen, but I'll, I, I will find out and let you know in just a minute because there can't be that many <laughs> that are in danger. It's going to be so one of the jewel. It's, it's going to be one of the jewel wings. I think I'm just not sure which jewel wing this is. Um, Jen is saying those are Appalachian jewel wing. Most likely, yeah. Also a species of conservation concern in the state of Maryland. All right, well, what like else do we have? Jen Selfridge made it, I'm so glad. Because, uh, and she said that it's Appalachian jewel wing. The, another question was, what about S1 status of Calafris polios, hoary elfin, and Celestrina neglecta major, Appalachian blue? So two different situations there. So hoary elfin, uh, was in fact seen collected in a large colony in Garrett County in a glade, uh, a, a freshwater glade um, in the mid nineties <clears throat> and two years thereafter. It's in a very hard to, to get to place. Uh, I am fairly confident that it's a large expanse. I'm fairly confident that it can still be there, but it hasn't been seen. Uh, for some years, or, or if Jen and crew have seen it, they haven't told us. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing where if you, if you find out that there's a population there, you don't really tell anybody about it because that's really important. Uh, it is quite likely, and this is part of the controversy around hoary elfin. Hoary elfin is found um, rather commonly in New Jersey, in some parts of New Jersey, in the pine woods, where it feeds on bearberry, the caterpillar feeds on bearberry, a little ericaceous heath plant um, that's very closely related to trailing arbutus. Well, as far as I know, there is not a lot or any bearberry in that, in that area where this hoary elfin was found. And there's some suggestion from some research done in Virginia and West Virginia that hoary elfin where it's found there uses um, trailing arbutus as a, an alternate host plant. So it's possible, A, it still exists in Maryland, although it hasn't been seen for some time. I tried finding it last uh, spring. I don't think I quite made it to the same spot that Richard Orr had it in the mid nineties. Um, but you know, the habitat looked good. Otherwise there's plenty of trailing arbutus, no bearberry, um, but did not see the butterfly. And I was probably late 
My guess is, so I was using the same dates that Richard had in the late 90s. My guess is it probably flies two weeks earlier now. So this year, if I go, I'll try a little earlier this year. The other is Appalachian Azure. So we have this Azure complex. We have a whole complex of Azure, some of which probably haven't been described yet, are new to science. I mean, we see them, we've collected them, but we don't know, we haven't figured out that they're new yet. Uh, um, Harry Pavillon and David Wright are describing these right and left, Holly Azure, Blueberry Azure, Cherry Gall Azure. One of them is Appalachian Azure. We've known about this one for a long time. It feeds only on black cohosh and its range is restricted to wherever there is black cohosh. It is, it is a species of conservation concern, but it is not yet endangered. Um, there are a couple of downward selection pressures on the black cohosh. Deer browse is one of them. Uh, forest succession is another one of them. When the canopy gets too crowded, uh, it doesn't survive quite as well. It needs a little bit of light uh, in there to do that. And then I think there's also an issue of uh, invasive species like garlic mustard and still grass that are crowding out the good stands of, of black cohosh. Right now, I'm concerned about it. I don't think it's in danger. It's, I don't think it's um, critical to the point of being endangered at this point. It is possible to see it on in many habitats which have good black cohosh stands, the ability to keep this butterfly in Maryland will depend on us being able to keep good quality stands of black cohosh. As long as the black cohosh is around, so will the Appalachian Azure be. Um, next question, um, what Maryland legislative initiatives will help with endangered butterflies? And I'm thinking myself, this was not my question, but also I was thinking about the pesticides uh, can definitely be looked at herbicides. Um, I know B there was something for BT for aphids near Baltimore, and I don't know what part of the state that bill was. We didn't actually follow it closely, but there was a bill limiting BT in some way in the state. But what other legislation would help? So I've been looking at a couple of different things. Um, for, for general butterfly biodiversity, uh, I would say that the most important thing we could do is stop growing lawns. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not alone in this. Uh, Doug Ptolemy, who was my office mate as a graduate student uh, back at New of Maryland, and, and I, you know, talk about this a lot, that if we just got rid of lawns and lawn maintenance, we'd have a much greater biodiversity of various kinds. And I think that's even true in the suburbs where we would probably have better butterfly biodiversity, even of some uncommon, if not uh, species of conservation concern. But the thing that I am, I think most interested in is a, is a bill that's currently making its way through the Texas legislature, uh, which requires that when you do any kind of uh, construction uh, on roads or bridges or infrastructure improvements, not, not you just, you don't have to just replace it with what you took out. They're requiring that if you took out trees, you replace it with shrubs and forbs and grasses. So they're trying to replace uh, more, more critical habitats rather than just plant more trees. And here in Maryland, we have a very weak restoration law, which says, you know, if you cut down some trees, you got to put trees back in their place. It would be much more helpful to butterfly conservation if instead of putting back trees where you've cut down trees, you actually created a mix of diverse habitats, which is the key for sustaining and maintaining butterfly uh, distribution and butterfly biodiversity in the state of Maryland. And I see that Guy got his answer about dwarf sink foil for the host plant for um, Appalachian grizzled skipper. Okay, so let's see, uh, we all of the questions. Oh, here's a question. It's interesting that you said the Eastern Monarch population is stable. Is it just a gimmick that the environmental groups seem to say they're in trouble when they ask for donations? Still being recorded, aren't I? Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, I, you know, the Monarch, People who are passionate about monarchs are very passionate about monarchs. And I absolutely understand why. They are the most charismatic creatures. Um, but 
but I, I get a little concerned every fall when people start posting about their monarch babies and you know, I, I'm, I, it's going to freeze tonight. What's going to happen to my monarch babies? Well, they're going to die. Um, and they should, because that means that they're some, some, somehow the female didn't get the right cues and you don't, you don't, you don't want to continue to, you know, insert genes in this population so that, uh, you know, future unfit generations happen. Um, but there's a lot of money being made selling monarch or selling milkweed to save the monarch. Well, we have so much milkweed in Maryland that is not used by monarch butterflies that planting more milkweed is going to do nothing for the monarch population. Zero. Planting wayside nectar stations isn't going to help them. You know, that's not the critical factor for them in Maryland. There is a critical factor and there is a place where you can do a lot of real good for monarchs. And that is in their southward migration in the fall we have eliminated almost all of their nectar resources and availability along the coast. If you're a monarch butterfly and you wanna fly south, the best thing you can do is fly right along the coast and let those sea breezes carry you all the way to the Gulf of Mexico and then cut over into, into Texas and down into uh, where you wanna uh, overwinter in, in, in Mexico. Although many of them also now overwinter in Florida. So even if we lost all the Mexican monarchs, we would not lose the monarch butterfly. Our Eastern monarchs, many of them will uh, survive in the, in the Gulf Coast and in Florida. But, you know, if, you, if you're trying to raise money uh, on the, the back of monarchs, the most iconic of our butterflies, the one that most kids learn in high school and grade school, the ones that people do coloring books about and have festivals about, you know, you want to paint as dire a picture as possible. Well, this is very, I was going to ask that question. Um, thank you for addressing that. Uh, I, uh, I do like monarchs, but I, I don't believe in being fanatic. At, and I, so um, do you, could you put your uh, blog site in the chat or your website? Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that for you. Okay. I've got it. Okay. So there's another question. I realized you said we have to consider everything. What are your thoughts on people who plant butterfly friendly plants? We sort of addressed that, but just thought I'd mention it. I think butterfly friendly plants are terrific, mostly because they're not just useful for butterflies. I mean, if you plant a pollinator garden, you're going to support many, many, many kinds of, of pollinators. And if you spend support many, many kinds of pollinators, you're going to support many, many kinds of birds and lizards and frogs and everything else that goes with them. Um, I, I think if you're going to plant butterfly friendly gardens, they should, I'm not a native fanatic, but I do believe that most of the time, if you want to be maximally effective for butterflies that are native, you plant native species or native ecotypes. When you're planting cultivars, you don't know what's happened in their genetic system. To, has, it, has it damaged their ability to have you know, high carbohydrate rich uh, pollen and or nectar? Do they have, this, do they have the same uh, chemical makeup as the, um, as the original wild type? Are they gonna be, uh, are the caterpillars gonna be able to thrive on these if that's what they're eating? There's so many unknowns about the use of cultivars, so that if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, do it right, do it with natives, and do it with native ecotypes, and don't buy things from stores where you don't know if they've treated them in the first place with any kind of insecticides. Probably one of the biggest mistakes people make is is going to Target or Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot, buying things that are pollinator friendly planting them, not realizing they've been sprayed with things that neonics in particular, they're gonna last for weeks or months and will kill anything that eats them, including butterflies that feed on the flowers. I saw a tiny bright blue butterfly today on a hike along the gunpowder. Any idea what it is? Oh, I do. In fact, I'm about to post a, a, a new blog on, uh, on Leplog in the next day or two about the what happens when summer comes before spring? And what do I mean about that? Well, um, for years, decades actually, since the days of Edwards, for whom Edwards Hairstreak was named, one of our leading uh, lepidopterists, um, since he screwed up in the first place, 
uh, we believe that the first butterfly out in the spring is spring azure, the first blue butterfly. Uh, and there are azures flying right now, blue azures, all in the genus Celestrina, just like the uh, Appalachian azure, Celestrina, neglect major. Um, the Celestrina that's flying right now actually is summer azure. It's not spring azure at all. Summer azure has many broods throughout the year. It's very common. Uh, and David Wright and Harry Pavillon have worked out the phenology and the taxonomy of this group in such a way that, you know, we now recognize that summer azure flies for about three weeks before spring azure ever comes out. Spring azure is going to be a candidate for conservation concern in Maryland before too much longer, I suspect, unless it's able to find another host that's able to complete its development on. Right now, it is almost exclusively dependent on flowering dogwood. And those of you who know flowering dogwood know that it's under a lot of pressure from a number of environmental pathogens and habitat destruction. And it, it, it's, it's, it is not the understory tree that it used to be in the state of Maryland and for which spring azure depends on it to be. Some spring azure has adapted to some other trees in Green Ridge. I have now found it on black cherry, for example. So there is a great possibility that it can make a resurgence based on its ability to switch host plants. And that's not unusual for butterflies. Um, our Maryland checkers, Baltimore checker spot, our state insect, here feeds on the relatively rare, uh, increasingly uncommon turtle head uh, and is in a very restricted uh, environment. In New England, it feeds on common plantain, which is everywhere. And the butterfly is much more common as a consequence. Now, it may also be a different species that has to be worked out. Uh, are you planning to put your conservation recommendations into a report that can be used to propose <clears throat> legislation? Well, I, I, I'm not, I just thought of up today, um, but um, you know, certainly if there's interest, I'm happy to work with anyone who's uh, interested in sort of pushing that forward. I think it's, it's, a, it's a high bar for many of these things because they, they go in the face of job creation, go in the face of industrial development, go in the face of all the things that you and Sierra Club know go hand in hand with habitat destruction and loss of species biodiversity. I, I and that's like, as Dave Mosher. I'm I sorry. would like to make a um, I'd like to make a comment on that. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. The um, we're, we've taken, I've taken about, uh, including yours, a whole bunch of action alerts, like where there's deer control, plant some, a huge amount of New Jersey tea for the, uh, the multi doubling that depends on it. Uh, and I would like everybody in this audience, uh, I've taken, written down about 30 action alerts. Uh, Rick has a whole bunch of them, so does Chuck Woolery, everybody else, if you could send them to us, action alerts you, that would actually help, like the one I just mentioned. Um, and I, I want to say that follow up on the legislation is April 14th. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful session, 7 to 9 p.m., on in this case, how to work with the feds uh, as the state state the maryland chapter tends to work on state legislation and and then when that's over we we put switch our focus to federal and we can bring up a lot of these legislative ideas and actually take action on that um one in particular that will come up is um and i want everybody to look at your calendar and please register for the april 14th 7 to 9 p.m um, and bring up your action alerts. Uh, one of them, of course, uh, I've just had a, a discussion with the staff of the uh, Stopping the Next Pandemic, <coughs> HR 151, which will reduce pand pandemics by about 50 <coughs> percent. Uh, like, no longer can people buy the scales of the endangered pangolin. That's just one of many examples um, in terms of so, so saving habitat. The Land and Water Conservation Fund is equally important to program open space. And fortunately, 
thanks to the Maryland Sierra Club we'd resurrected during the Trump period in the national chapter thanked Maryland so much for our work led by Earl Bradley of all people uh, so uh, I, I want to make sure everybody attends that webinar and the other one coming up of course is on a moths on April 26 and led by Kelly uh, Wickstead uh, at 7 p.m. and please sign up for that and I just want to mention uh, a, a little bit as a joke a luna moth who I love by the way and it depends on certain species of trees like sweet gum for the host for its larvae uh, said to me uh, we're not as beautiful as a butterfly cousins but please save us too <laughs> um, <clears throat> so those are the two next uh, events coming up um, now I'd like to go go back uh, while we still have time uh, does anybody else have some <clears throat> please send in your action items and if anybody else has some more Q&A's uh, please Mark I just wanted to I just wanted to address the monarch uh, issue again just really briefly here I absolutely agree that monarchs make really terrific um, uh, examples of species development and keystone species and metamorphosis and a lot of those things and draw attention to conservation causes. My concern, and this is my concern with many endangered species proposals, it, it dilutes the meaning of the Endangered Species Act if you can go into your backyard basically any week of the summer and see an endangered species. And that is my concern about the petition to list the, the monarch as an endangered species, because it, in the public mind, it creates this belief that this is, in fact, a, something that's about to wink out of existence. I think it makes a really terrific teaching platform for teaching about conservation, for teaching about the interconnectedness of milkweed, for teaching this incredible story about migration. Endangered species status probably isn't going to make that any better. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, we can use it as a tool to get good legislation done, but we're going to make sure it's appropriate good legislation. Uh, Glenstone, uh, <clears throat> where we had a Sierra Club retreat, they were so proud of the fact that they did not have a monarch butterfly habitat. They had a butterfly garden habitat to support all species of butterflies. And by the way, I taught them how to remove invasives and thank me they did it. So, uh, we, but, but that's an example. But everybody in the audience, please uh, bring up any other points you, you want to make right now. Well, there was one coming. more question, Mark. Can I uh, read please. that? Um, why do I see what I think is blue frosted banner butterfly in the Allegheny uh, National Forest and Pittsburgh? Aren't those butterflies native to Central and South America? So I responded to Tanisha and I said, well, if I had a dollar for every erroneous butterfly sign I saw in federal lands, I could probably support this chapter in perpetuity. <laughs> oh, you, you don't have to go far to see them either. If you go out to the butterfly garden at Patuxent Wildlife Refuge North Tract, hmm. don't get me started. Okay. Does anybody um, else have a question that in, in the chat or that hasn't been addressed or not in the chat that you'd like to ask now while we still have our patient speakers speaking to us? And uh, I want to say that the staff at Patuxent and Wildlife are good people, so we could get them to change. Who wants to contact them and get them to we'll, we'll get inf get detailed information from Rick on what to tell them to change how they do it. So, so it's not that they haven't been told and it's not that they haven't been apprised of this. It's expensive to build those signs. Oh, and once you make a mistake, you have to wait for your next funding cycle. Okay. Those come around very seldom. <clears throat> so okay. before we leave, remember everybody, uh, it would be great for you to all register for the April 14th and the April 26th Natural Place Committee meetings. It was such an honor spending time with you all this evening. Thank you so much for your attention and your great questions. And I hope to see you out looking and observing for butterflies and their habitats and their conservation in 2021. Sierra Club, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.
Yes, thank you. Great job, Rick, thank you. You're welcome, thanks a bunch. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Since Jen is off, like I, I was going to say, Jen um, asked me to say something about swap. I didn't see that until the last uh, minute, or I would have said something about it. But um, so, at, at one point, I was part of the state wildlife action committee meeting and, and helped put together some of the recommendations for butterflies of, of conservation concern. There was a strong push that many of us then re resisted, and didn't happen to list the monarch as a Maryland state endangered species. And when pushed about why they thought this was an important thing, it wasn't that they thought that the butterfly was endangered. It was that if, if they were federally endangered, we would be in line for state money and they didn't want to lose out on getting state money if it was federally endangered. So to do that, they wanted to list it as endangered so they would be in line for federal money if it became federally endangered. That's probably not the best way to make those decisions. Uh, that raises a question. Are there any federal uh, species that we should get listed as endangered in order to get uh, money for, uh, you get support? Not in Maryland. Um, we don't have any federally endangered species or even on the wait list, except for Maryland, which is officially, or except for monarchs, which is officially on the, on the wait list. Um, okay. You know, we, we don't have, most of the species that are butterflies, at least, that are on the endangered species lists federally uh, or a threatened status or otherwise of conservation concern are subspecies of widespread butterflies that have adapted to a particular local climate. San Bruno's elfin, uh, for example, right, right next to San Francisco airport. Um, and the only place it can be found. But the reality is you can find a different population of elephants on every mountaintop in the Bay Area. And that's really what we've been seeing is that there are these isolated populations that because of the mountains have become productively isolated. Now, does that mean that that individual population is of such concern that it should be listed as endangered or do you look at the entire population of brown elephants in the east in the Bay Area, which is what that is, or the entire population of blues in that area, which is what those are. But Carter blue is a is a close relative of very, very common species. And in fact, there are places where Carter blue is very common. It's the habitat that is uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, and to preserve the butterfly, you have to preserve the habitat and large amounts of habitat. Butterflies, you'd think they're small and they can't, you know, they don't need to need a lot, but they do need much larger uh, landscapes than you think. <clears throat> don't uh, carnal blues need uh, Lupinus perennis? Uh, carnal blues actually feed on lupins. Um, and the lupins are not as common as they used to be. It's the habitat there. They need some version of the Albany scrub. Um, so they, it looks a lot like the New Jersey pine barrens, except with a lot of, uh, with a lot of, uh, of lupins. The closest thing we have to that is the frosted elephant here in Maryland, which feeds on lupins. Um, and lupins are really uncommon in Maryland. Uh, you can find frosted elephant most places where you find lupins, but lupins need that sandy soil. Uh, the lupins that we have, sundial lupins, need that sandy soil open sun, not a lot of competition from other plants, or they won't thrive. And if they don't thrive, then the frosted elephant doesn't either. Well, the lupinus perennis, the lupins we've got here. Um, oh, lupinus, I'm sorry, I thought you said pinus. The lupinus, yes, the lupin, yes, yes, yes. Uh, they, do need, they do need that lupin as a, as a host plant. Um, but a lot of them here in Maryland, I believe are on <clears throat> Excuse me, electric right of ways, uh, uh, the um, BGE uh, right of ways. Uh, yeah. 
but that the go has to place to see, um, the, the go to place to see them in Maryland actually is that little uh, road leading away from the um, oh heck I'm the Nassauango fire um, um, furnace town uh, right there in the Nassauango swamp. So if you park in that parking lot and walk down the, the road, I'm forgetting the name of it, that runs a, across from the parking lot there, uh, within the next half a mile or so, there's a lot of lupin on the shoulders on both sides. You can find frosted elf in there, almost guaranteed, unless the county has decided to mow already. Now, where is that? I missed that. So Nassauango Furnace Town, um, which is in the Nassauango um, uh, floodplain in, close to Snow Hill, on your way to Snow Hill, Pocomoke City. Um, just before you get there, Furnace Town, it's a living history site with some really, it's some really interesting um, uh, TNC property as well, Nature Conservancy property. But there's also an, an asphalt road, and I'm just blanking on the name of it, that comes to a T uh, with um, Furnace Town Road, I think is the name of the road that takes you off of Route 12 uh, to take you over there. And there's a road that comes in at a T, and the first, quarter, half a mile of that is where we always see um, on the lupins on the right hand, particularly on the right hand side, but increasing now on the left, they're beginning to increase a little bit because TNC is trying, uh, most of that area there is managed on the right hand side, at least by TNC, uh, is trying to preserve that habitat, open up and burn some of that habitat to make a better habitat for the lupins and also then for the frosted elephant. Also, if you, um, in that same general area, if you go off on the left down, um, uh, church, there's a church road there. Uh, another large power cut, um, not too far from there on the other side of the road, uh, also has significant populations of lupin and good populations of frosted elephant. Hmm. And it's being managed rather heavily um, for, um, uh, particularly for lupin. <clears throat> There's a suspicion it may also feed on Baptisia tinctoria, our wild indigo, um, and we're, we're tracking that. I've seen it all the positing, but I haven't seen it complete a life cycle on that yet. That's interesting because I've, I've planted a, recently a number of those plants, but they're still babies, so it's not going to be attra attracting much. Yeah, when I plant uh, species, I try and uh, plant a, a bunch of them. For instance, the New Jersey tea, I think I've got something like, oh, I don't know, somewhere maybe 15 of them. So you start having not just one, but a bunch to attract um, the various uh, species that need to use them as host plants. Sure, they're wonderful pollinator plants. Um... I think the issue with the, I suspect the issue with model dusky wing may be that it requires the shale habitat where most of our New Jersey tea was found uh, historically anyway. Um, I suspect in the same way that Olympia marble needs the shale habitat, um, the model dusky wing may need the shale habitat as much as it needs the New Jersey tea. Uh -huh. And back well, to the frosted elephant, you know, those caterpillars don't eat the leaves, they eat the buds the flower buds, the flowers, and the emerging seed pods. That's all they feed on. Interesting. The high, the high energy pieces of the plant. And well, where there are fewer chemicals. I live near a, a serpentine barren, not Soldier's Delight, the, the one in, uh, it's also Baltimore County. It's Lake Roland uh, yep. Park area. And although I am not in the serpentine, uh, I do uh, believe I've got like a lot of magnesium uh, in my soil, so I'm, I'm not in standard uh, soils, uh, though I'm also, I noticed by pulling up the soil analysis that uh, I'm either uh, part of the property uh, might be nice. But again, I am pretty close to the Serpentine Baron. There's also... Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah? Go ahead. Uh, there's also... The, the... <laughs> Go ahead. 
the the issue with serpentine barons there's a <clears throat> there's a there's a butterfly fauna in the serpentine barons you don't find in the shale barons and vice versa uh, leonard skipper for example is one that's almost entirely restricted to serpentine soils and it's one we see around labor day every year univoltine but in this case a fall univoltine only emerges in the uh, late summer early fall so what's a host plant for the leonard skipper did you say a uh, blue stem which of course is widely distributed in the state of Maryland, um, but uh, big and little blue stem, most of the little blue stem and soldier's delight. Um, you know, it's the only thing it feeds on. And that's the only, the only place you can find is those dry xeric environments with very low um, nu you know, nutritional quality, very low nutrients, poor nutrients. It's not so much that there's poor nutrients, it's the serpentine and chromium in the soil prevent plants from taking up the nutrients sufficiently. Right. Well, one of the problems with the, the Lake Roland serpentine is that uh, uh, it hasn't been burned and uh, there are a lot of trees coming in. Um, and greenbrier, <clears throat> I suspect. Huge amounts of green briar. Yes, I, I went there to look for some Asclepias verticillata a couple years ago, and I felt like I was uh, entering the domain of uh, what what is it uh, the 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 Sleeping Beauty or one of those uh, <laughs> fairy tales? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing is that there are problems with Miscanthus sinensis spreading into there. That's highly invasive in that environment. Yeah. Yes. It favors the same situations that blue stem does. It's not surprising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, are there other um, rare butterflies that uh, like the serpent, the plants that grow in the serpentine? Cobweb skipper is another one that comes to mind. It's widely distributed in Maryland, also in xeric populate, xeric landscapes, the most common place to find that. And it flies in the spring, middle to end of May uh, in the Serpentine Barrens. Beautiful little skipper. Cobweb skipper, it's named because it has that, a really beautiful, delicate uh, cobweb-like tracery on its hind wings. Mm -hmm. Also feeds on blue stem. Well, I've certainly got blue stem in my landscaping, so. You'll see the, like the Leonard land. Skipper. Yeah, but you'll see the, the Leonard Skipper on uh, Lyotris in the fall. You always find them coming out at the same time that Lyotris starts to bloom. It's about the only thing that they, they feed on. The Pelosa? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got some of that. But again, it's not mature enough at this point. So I've got to encourage it to, I just think I put it in last year. Well, this has been very interesting. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Very kind of you to put in an extra 15 minutes for these questions. Thank you so much. Rick. Oh, I'm happy to do it. Amazing. Um, I definitely would like you, if you could, to send me some resources I could share. I, I know Mark will be sending out the minutes mm -hmm. to everybody. Um, and uh, we kind of ran out of time at the end there. So if you um, could send some resources, that would be absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm I will. I was going to put the I was going to put the two field guides that I think people would find the most use in um, because that would be useful for folks. Do you uh, want to tell me now? I'll, I'll put it in the chat if you know the names. Well, I think most people have left the chat already, but yes. Um, no, no, I, I have it for me to put in the. <laughs> oh, for you. Yeah. Yes, the uh, the butterflies of Pennsylvania. That's David Wright's book, and ninety five percent of everything they have, we have, and it's the best, just the best guide I think uh, for our area available. And then there's also um, the I think my go to guide, um, which is Butterflies of North America by Ken Kaufman. <clears throat> 